Thank you, folks. Been a real short break, huh? Um, this is our last uh, session for today's symposium. Uh, Rosemary Joyce, who you heard from earlier, um, will be the moderator. Now, after this session, I just want to remind you that we're going to have a brief book signing. If you already have your books or um, if you haven't picked them up already, you can just get one on your way as you exit out. We're going to have all the contributing authors um, sit at the table outside the, outside the auditorium to sign uh, the book, uh, Revealing Ancestral Central America. So um, that said, Rosemary, take it away. Thanks. So um, as uh, Ronald mentioned, this is going to be a slightly different format. We want to have an interactive discussion. But before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, our speakers. Fabio Amador um, directs the National Geographic Society Weight Grants Program. He's also an associate research professor of anthropology at George Washington University and executive director and president of Foundation OLAS, an organization devoted to capacity building for Latin American scholars dedicated to the study and preservation of the submerged cultural heritage that's underwater archaeology. He's an archaeologist specializing in the documentation and visualization of terrestrial and underwater biocultural heritage sites and has worked in archaeological sites throughout the Americas, presently, presently conducting research on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Um, Fabio is also developing research projects with Cuban scientists for the study of underwater archaeological sites. His interest in Taino Indian culture, which spanned the Greater Antilles, which you've heard a lot about today, is focused on the exploration of submerged cave systems where much ritual activity occurred. And previously, he was a professor of archaeology and researcher for the Council for Scientific Investigation at the National University of El Salvador. Um, Christina Luke, let's see what, what it actually says here so that I don't, um, is a senior lecturer in the writing program and archaeology department at Boston University. She earned her doctorate in anthropology from Cornell University, where I had the pleasure of being an outside member of her doctoral committee. Doesn't say that here. Her work focuses on cultural heritage policy and management, as well as the study of archaeological landscapes in Central America. She's worked on programs with the Cultural Heritage Center of the Department of State, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and the Cultural Heritage Center at the University of Pennsylvania's museum. She is chair of the Cultural Heritage Policy Committee of the Archaeological Institute of America, and editor-in-chief for the Journal of Field Archaeology. And now I have to flip backwards. This is actually fun, and I don't have. Ah, there it is. Um, Francisco Uloa uh, Corrales is an archaeologist in the Department of Anthropology and History of the National Museum of Costa Rica. He specializes in the formative period of southern Costa Rica and studied um, archaeology at the University of Costa Rica, received his PhD from the University of Kansas. In 1989 to 1990, he was awarded a Hubert Humphrey Fellowship to undertake research at the Smithsonian Institution. He's worked at archaeological sites in Central and Southeast Costa Rica and is presently conducting research in the Diquis Delta on sites with the well-known stone spheres, which we saw one example of in a photograph. He's currently coordinating an effort to have these stone spheres declared world patrimony and placed on the UNESCO list. Corrales was also the general director of the National Museum of Costa Rica between 2003 and 2008, and he served as the Costa Rican representative to the Central American Museum Network for seven years. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually ask a, a few questions and basically see what our panelists have to say, and hopefully we'll do that for about half an hour, and then we'll open this up for more dialogue with you in the audience. So the first thing that I, I thought was worth talking about, especially um, because everybody here has been, has on the ground experience, is the question of um, the actual uh, excavators who are sometimes digging up archaeological heritage sites for uh, subsistence purposes because they are poor. What, what do we find um, this is very removed from the people who might ultimately pay large amounts of money to buy these things as collectors in the world heritage markets. What do we think are, or what do we find, are successful ways to try to begin to combat that kind of, of digging when we're dealing with people for whom it is sometimes the only economic opportunity? 
You want to begin? Right, yes. Well, in, in Costa Rica, there's a long history of uh, looting and vandalism uh, that began um, probably at the time of the con conquest. But uh, it was during the late 19th century and early 20th century, there was a lot of uh, digging going on and a lot of business uh, allowed by the government. And it was considered, well, it was considered something uh, that it was uh, okay to do it. But uh, right now, I, I don't think there's a big problem with vandalism. I mean, most of the, the cemeteries have been already looted. Uh, we are more concerned now with the development of infrastructure uh, because it's causing a more uh, devastating damage. Uh, even when, when we went, when we go to, to a looted site, there's a still a lot of information there. But when you have these uh, huge companies uh, changing the landscape radically, there's nothing, absolutely nothing left. Um, what we are doing also is uh, working with the communities, the local communities, uh, raising um, war, our, uh, war, uh, awareness um, about the importance of the patrimony, of the uh, archaeology, uh, archaeological patrimony. And for the first time, the National Museum is getting involved in the conservation, protection, and managing of archaeological sites and working with local communities in management projects and trying to benefit them, uh, trying to provide elements for the people to understand that patrimony is not, uh, to invest in patrimony or to conserve patrimony is not a waste of money or time, but it's another alternative, uh, not only to uh, re reobtain uh, elements for constructing identity, but also a way to provide economic alternatives also. So that's something that we have found and we, something that we have learned from the conservation of the natural patrimony. It's not only altruism that is working, but you have to show people to prove that they are also going to have some benefit. Yes, well, uh, several experiences. In 1995, when I was director of archaeology for El Salvador, I used to tour all the major sites. One of them was Cihuatan in the central uh, Salvadoran region, and I got there and I looked into the horizon and there were two people digging. They were digging a hole and I said, I got them, you know, because I was the cultural police. So I snuck up and all of a sudden my heart was beating fast because I didn't know if they had machetes or a shotgun that would shoot me. And I was surprised to see that it was an old man about 80 years old, completely skinny, and his grandson. And they were chasing an iguana. Right, so we consider them looters because they're digging, they're destroying, they're taking away. But in fact, I realized back then that it's an enormous social problem. Following that event, I had a meeting with the director of the cultural patrimony. He asked me, Fabio, how many archaeologists does it take to protect an archaeological site? Is it five, ten? You know, I said, you know even a thousand couldn't protect it because they always got to go out for a break, right? And that beer break, somebody will come in and take it. So it's really the people, that old man and his son, the people that live around the sites are the ones who right now, unfortunately, they think they're benefiting from looting, but they're not. They're giving it away, essentially. So if we had a program, and things have evolved a little bit since then, and it's happening, if we had a program where the people surrounding these local communities could not only find identity through time in those sites, but could also find a, a sense of ownership in protecting the area that will be at least a source of uh, intimidation for people from the outside to come in and destroy the cultural patrimony. And that's what we did, in fact. In several of the five archeological sites, uh, national parks in El Salvador, we incorporated the folks that surrounded the sites, like Carasucia, Cihuatan, and other sites, to use the land, sometimes uh, for grazing cattle, others for chopping wood for firewood. I mean, you have to interact while the policy, uh, generally speaking, still stands that everybody out. You know, this is, this is the message from the government, right? Uh, here's the fence, inside is ours, cultural patrimony, outside is yours. And I think that that has caused a lot of uh, friction between different political parties, communities, and even the archaeologists becoming uh, one of the targets for, for people who 
feel that they have been left out. So I think that one of the ways that we can go about in the future uh, to protecting sites and stop looting or protect the sites from looting is to think about not legislation uh, in the sense of coming up with something new, but rather bring the communities inside uh, and having them be part of the experience. Uh, I mean, it's a lot more complex, right, because it's economic. But I think that that sense of ownership and that sense of uh, history, of tangible uh, identity, uh, have played a very crucial and positive role in El Salvador when we started doing it. And I think that that's, that was a great example. Um, I don't... Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Just okay. A little bit closer to All right. Um, I don't have much to add. Um, at the local level, it's been some time, unfortunately, since I've had the opportunity to go to Central America. I used to spend time in Honduras specifically, and it's, it's not a country um, that in the last few years um, I've been able to get back to, and security, of course, is an issue as well. Um, but I would like to echo um, what I've heard, and that putting up boundaries, um, it, it hasn't worked. People have tried it for years. And tr so trying to engage local people with conversations about not only what it means to them and their identity, but also what you are doing as the archaeologist. Um, so science isn't bad. Um, science can be very um, informative. It provides a texture and context um, of length of time, change over time, that can be very meaningful to local communities and in turn can inform your research. And that's some of the work that I've done elsewhere in the world. Um, that sort of collaboration has proved to be incredibly rich. Um, I want to actually um, go back and build off something Francisco uh, brought up and actually ask each of our panelists, um, you've already said that you see as a, a greater threat in, uh, in Costa Rica the development of infrastructure. And I want to ask each of our panelists, what do you see right now as the major threat that um, exists for cultural heritage in this region generally? I don't know if you want to add to your comments before. Well, yeah, uh, infrastructure, uh, also massive tourism that is going there and also promoting, it's, it's in a good way promoting art, uh, handicrafts, but uh, also handicrafts can be a way to um, dissimulate or uh, uncover, uh, uncover is the smuggling or selling of illegal yeah. trafficking, exactly. Uh, so I would say uh, uh, this uh, uncontrolled development of infrastructure, uh, the illegal trafficking now is in the, obtaining new ways to do it. For example, the internet auctions or the internet uh, selling of artifacts by internet. Uh, and then also the um, lack of uh, commitment of politicians in the uh, enacting of laws that will not only uh, prosecute people for doing those things, but prevent and uh, to conserve uh, not only the objects, or protect the objects, but also the archaeological sites. In Costa Rica, it's very dramatic, the situation. We have registered almost 4,000 archaeological sites, but only nine have some kind of legal protection. So we, now, we are now working on, on laws that uh, prevent trafficking and punish people that uh, do those kind of things. But we want laws also that will protect the sites, the, the few sites that can be uh, you know, developed as a yeah. integral. Uh, and that would be a major, a major challenge to, to do that. Yeah. And I have to say that my experience in Honduras echoes that, um, in that although the law made destruction of sites by development illegal, in fact, mm -hmm. um, development always was a higher focus, and so sites disappeared under bulldozers regularly, and once Absolutely. they're gone, the objects might be kept, but the knowledge is gone. Um, I'm also interested in the fact that you brought up tourism. I think um, that's something that Christina has also been looking at, is the impact of tourism. I think, um, for me, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, and be happy to talk about later, the international trade in antiquities and security, um, how things move between countries, um, within country, uh, the groups that um, promote those networks, um, how things come into the United States, but also how they come into um, some of the larger markets um, that we're seeing, particularly um, outside of the U.S. But in the question of tourism, and I think that gets us to the, the question of the village, which is where Rosemary started um, the session today, 
The big engines behind this, um, the development, the people doing development, whether it's an individual, a corporation, or the large engines of the United Nations um, development uh, people, the UNDP or USAID, they're focused on sustainable development, and they often link with UNESCO cultural heritage sites. Um, and whether those are the fully inscribed cultural sites like Tikal, or whether they're more of the softer side of things, which is the intangible heritage that we heard about today, um, where it might be song, it might be language, it might be something else. Um, and they might be mixed. This is a new category. It could be cultural or natural. Um, and it might be a cultural landscape, which increasingly had nodes, and then you have pathways that connect them. Um, the hospitality industry, the hotels, the people doing the development are keenly aware that there is this UNESCO World Heritage List, TripAdvisor is one of their partners, um, and that to me is where the development side of things is really most scary. Um, and where archeologists, we don't tend to think, how is my work impacting the larger engine behind economic development? Who are those players? Um, and how can I be at that table as well? Because I understand the, the archeological heritage here. Uh, I have collaborators in country who are academics, uh, but I also have collaborators at the local level. Um, and so trying to get us into that conversation, particularly as these corridors and routes, um, and you go from node to node, this is a particularly hot topic in southeastern Europe, um, all throughout Europe, whether it's the roots of the olive tree or in the footsteps of Alexander the Great, um, there are moments that we see this coming to Latin America on a greater stage. And that hasn't hit in, in the way that it has in other areas of the world. We, ha we haven't seen that yet in Central America, but I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, I was surprised in preparing for this when I went to the World Travel and Tourism Council numbers to see projected growth rates and the countries that look to have the most opportunity. And Honduras is listed as number 20 um, out of over 180 countries. Um, so that was surprising to me, uh, particularly given the security concerns there, but it's something we should watch. Uh, yes, there's two things that I wanted to mention that unfortunately when I was uh, living in El Salvador and working there, archaeology was equal to tourism. So in a, in a way, it was a huge problem for us because opening up a site kind of meant bringing the Ruta Maya around there and then not being able to mitigate the impact uh, as a future problem was never thought about. Uh, and the legislative part is actually problematic. In fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but two years ago was the, the first national director for uh, antiquities was, was uh, jailed, uh, in fact, uh, for selling out, you know, for the destruction of cultural patrimony. So I'm not saying all the national directors have that, uh, that side, that dark side, but the thing is that policy comes and goes, you know, to, to meet expectations of the ruling party. And I think, again, that educating the people who we work with uh, uh, and bringing a managed tourism into their lives, into their world, into their sites, it could be uh, one possible solution. But if we just push for a new policy, uh, I think that we may end up with a new source of problems, which has definitely been clear in El Salvador. And um, sort of conflating these two questions together, I would, I would echo everything that's been said. Certainly in the case of Honduras, um, working with the previous uh, government, we were able to begin working on local level stewardship and education efforts. And at my dissertation site of Cerro Palenque, there still is a community group which goes regularly up to the site, which is technically a national park but not open. And they go there regularly to clean up, up the growing, overgrown vegetation and they have um, educational projects in town. They would love to have visitation for, uh, for development of the local economy, but they understand the site is their history. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an economic resource to local people, whereas from a national perspective, often these are seen just as local as economic resources. Right, and, and I admit that I'm an idealist, right? And what I'm describing sounds like somewhere in the future, another world, but in fact, Caminal Huyu in downtown Guatemala during the past two years has been under the direction of Barbara Arroyo and when I, when I was there this year, I was amazed that they had opened up the park, they had created uh, 
senderos, uh, paths, and there was actually a place where 365 days a year, there are few Maya priests or shamans conducting a ceremony. The park is completely open, it's interactive, you know, and it's being taken, I mean, it's a positive change to, be, to what was before. Again, you know, the signs stay out, get out. And I think that, that this type of community interaction is, it could be part of the, the future. And even in a place like uh, the area around San Pedro Sula, where people have, much as in El, we've heard in El Salvador, the government has deliberately broken the chain of memory, historical memory, um, people have an investment in these sites as part of the history that their families lived through. Um, so that's a resource to draw on. I guess um, the last question that I had, and I hopefully will have a chance for each person to comment briefly on it, is the international scene. Um, how, is, how are these issues of cultural heritage, preservation, and protection working between your country and the international scene, which is, as we all know, um, a critical actor, especially in the demand for antiquities? Well, um, Costa Rica has been a, a provider, a provider of antiquities for more than, more, more than 100 years. And what we are doing now is working with uh, some entities like Interpol or, you know, to prevent. But the problem is that there's a lot of auctions or, or, or items that being, is being uh, uh, selling, sell, sold in, in Internet, but it's very few chances to uh, avoid that because most of the legislation in uh, first world countries is uh, designed to uh, protect collectionists, collection, collectors. So uh, we go through the diplomatic uh, ways to try to, you know, they say, uh, do, do, uh, try to stop that, and it's almost impossible to do. That. Uh, the red list of the UNESCO, you have to inscribe the, the, the goods that have been stolen and you have a record of that, otherwise it's not possible to do it. So at the international level, it's, there's very little chance to uh, avoid the selling of, of uh, antiquities or heritage from a specific countries. Um, we, in Costa Rica, we have signed it, most of the uh, international conventions. We are in the process of signing this agreement with the U.S. For, to prevent illegal trafficking, but uh, still, we, don't, we don't have that. Uh, so there are a few chances to do that. Uh, it, it, we need some uh, international agreement about the presence of uh, antiquities of our countries in uh, first world countries. Uh, I remember talking about this uh, in a meeting uh, in, a, in a new French museum that uh, is, we propose the recognition of property of our countries of all uh, items that have been, you know, uh, taken from, let's say, Costa Rica. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we want all those items back. Probably we want the recognition of property, but uh, in exchange, we can have training, we can have uh, other loans, we have some uh, uh, technological uh, assistance, uh, but uh, that would be a major step to recognize that those items, even though at that moment the, the legislation was uh, uh, permitted, uh, the, the extraction of those items, uh, that, that was uh, something that was do, done under particular situation that should be corrected. So that would be a major step to change the situation. Great. Christina? Um, let's see uh, where to start. Um, I think at the international level, um, between Central America and the global community, the international community, um, the trade in antiquities is a large one. Um, I know one of the newest markets, new being in the last five or ten years, is in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and I don't think we think about the private individual in Abu Dhabi being interested in material from Central America. But increasingly, it is Central American material that is new, that is sexy, and that's the material um, that they are very, very interested in. Um, and there's very little regulation there, and so traffic, trafficking in material um, is relatively, it's fluid. Um, within the United States, which while it may not be the major market, um, we do have increasingly good connections with Central America under some of the memorandum of understanding. Um, we don't have something with Costa Rica, but uh, there are um, 
through various legal instruments and policies um, with Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Um, the big issue is that it doesn't cover colonial material most of the time. Um, it covers pre-Columbian. There's a need now to cover more of the colonial material. And what's interesting about those memoranda is while part of it focuses on objects, the other part focuses on things like loans, loans with museums, or training programs for security of sites, or uh, collaboration with individuals and development programs. Um, and so if you are successful in having a memorandum, which is a huge, long process, um, there are other things that come with that that can be very beneficial within the country. So I think a lot of the times we, we talk about the trade without understanding that some of those memorandum have in-country, on the ground, really important ways of networking within country, but also between those countries as well. Yes, and I, I was really fortunate to participate in the last memorandum of understanding between El Salvador and the States. So at, at a different level, in a localized uh, perspective, I suppose that it is working. In fact, two years ago, it was all over the news where there was a shipment of 20 vessels that were stopped, and then the ambassador of El Salvador in Washington, D.C., uh, held a conference, and we actually used those uh, images from the vessels to invite the Salvadoran community to come and look at some of their history and, and some of the pottery. And so we turned something difficult into something positive, but there's a lot of holes, you know, in, in that legislation where historical artifacts, were, which are just as meaningful, of course, and important. And now that you mention uh, Asia as being <laughs> one of the areas of, I mean, we, we don't have anything with them, you know, so it gives you a perspective of how enormous this problem is. I mean, everyone is interested in antiquities, in, in effect. Uh, and that's a, that's a positive thing because we could expand our knowledge, our understanding of the past and our history uh, to the world. However, the artifacts leaving our space is not the intention. And so a policy uh, that has been beneficial in terms of the United States and El Salvador is the MOU which we're really grateful for. But you know, that's again uh, based on the willingness of the diplomats to continue those efforts. So it's tricky to, to, to foresee it. Uh, we recommended, and this is a public statement, uh, that it should be a perpetual agreement, not an understanding based on a four-year term, for example. And so that sealed and delivered, I mean, there's no way that it could change, and I think that that's the type of policy that you need because, you know, it's, it's been more than a thousand years since those obstacles were created, perhaps, sometimes, and that's not going to change. So why should we make a flexible policy that will not protect them? So I've seen a very positive side of things, and I think that more work in Central America with Costa Rica coming online and perhaps doing a Central American, a Latin American, imagine, the Caribbean, uh, policy that will help us in, in many ways. Well, and we have, I think, um, finished this round of questioning right on time to open it up for your comments or questions for anybody um, on this panel. And I see that Reynold has gone back to the... I can walk the mic to whoever has a question. And we invite those of you who might have experience in this regard as well to chime in and, and give your thoughts on what might be good ways to promote consciousness of cultural heritage, to um, limit the damage done by illicit excavation, and to try to begin to form more positive relationships between museums and the countries, the source countries, the countries of origin, which is a, a definitely a positive and new th uh, thing on the landscape in recent years. Um, I just wanted to I don't uh, to to ask um, whether there are models out there of good cultural heritage protection. Um, I'm sad to say and somewhat ashamed to say that I don't think that the United States has the best record on cultural heritage protection. Um, I think sites are still being destroyed left and right all around us, especially by developers. But it's been my impression that the UK in particular is one of those places where a sense of history, a sense of identity, a sense of ownership is something that's found throughout the United Kingdom, where when archaeological finds are made, those are reported to the authorities. There are 
good archaeological uh, organizations that protect those. Um, and um, it, it's my impression that they're doing a mostly good job. Are there other countries to whom we can look for models that are working in protecting their, their, their archaeological heritage? Christina, do you want to lead off with the... Um, I think a lot of it is, is context-specific. Um, I've, all of the time that I spent in Latin America and Central America, particularly in Honduras, um, but also in Soconusco, um, in Guerrero, um, and other areas of Yucatan, the indigenous communities were very real. Um, and their, their presence, their histories, their legacy there um, is something that we need to take into consideration um, and put at the, the beginning. Um, it's where we need to start from. Um, when you look to areas of the Mediterranean or Europe, you're often looking at something very different. Um, you don't have the legacies in place that you, that you want to tie to a deep past. Um, but you often do have legacies in place, just no one's asked. Uh, so in, in countries like Turkey, where you have a 1923, you, you sever the, the present and the past right there, trying to go back now, that's part of what they're beginning to do, is understand that history isn't necessarily evil. Um, you mentioned the UK. I think English Heritage is doing some really excellent work, um, and particularly with inventorying um, and understanding what's there. Um, and that's half the battle, is understanding what's in your backyard and who might care about it, um, whether you do or not. Um, if you understand who else may want access to it, you can come up with a collaborative partnership um, that might make sense. And so I think a lot of that is technology-based. People mentioned methods. Um, but technology has such amazing capabilities these days, whether it's in collecting oral histories, um, whether it's through documentation of sites, through 3D modeling, or through just a basic point on the map, but that it, having it be accurate so we know where those sites are now. Um, and I, all of that stuff, English Heritage is, is doing a really good job. I don't know if I've totally answered your question, but I think context-specific is really important. Yeah, and if I could just add a little more to that, in the underwater archaeological world, specifically in, in, in England, uh, there, was, there, there are s several great examples of how it has been very positive for you know, this recognition of the importance of cultural heritage. And that, again, comes down to uh, archaeologists essentially opening the doors and letting other specialists, in this case divers, who uh, come in and be part of the experience. And I, th I think it teaches a great lesson, is that uh, perhaps, you know, and I, I speak for myself, of course, my opinion, perhaps us archaeologists have kept the world out, thinking that, you know, they won't understand us. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, for me and my colleagues to really dig and, and understand uh, at a different level, but the truth is, is that the public is just as aware, although they use different terminology and uses of history, uh, and they want to be a part of it. So it's about communicating science. And I think that, that it's worth trying, at least in Central America and Latin America, to communicate the results, the events, and the activities surrounding archaeological research so they could themselves be part of that experience and preserve that heritage. Uh, there's a famous case in, well, several famous underwater uh, ships, uh, Mary Celeste, I believe, in England, that they are in existence today because of this uh, Collabor collaboration or collaborative spirit between the archaeologists, the divers, conservators, and other folks. So I think that our archaeology in that sense, in that positive experience, has become more of an incorporative uh, perspective and, and route that has worked. So I, I welcome people uh, to work with me who have completely different and diverse uh, experience, academic or otherwise, and usually what I find is a fresh vision of how we should look at things. Do we have another question? One, one, two, and three. Go ahead. Hello. Um, yes. I just wanted to point it out. I am an anthropologist. I've been working in Amazonia with no recently contacted or uncontacted people. And this is another aspect of preservation. We're talking about the risks um, and the vulnerability 
I just wanted to ask you if you know there is already a real full integration of non-material or uncontacted people protection. I mean, talking in terms of not only some artifacts or even archaeology sites that were completely devastated in Amazonia, for instance, by oil research, by lumberers and all that stuff, but also once the contact is done, normally as an anthropologist, I have been pretty bad isolated, you know? I got this stuff that it, it was a complete massacre. This is in, in Peru, for instance, uh, in the Camisea gas area. Well, these people, the Nahua people, Yura Nahuas from the Pano ethnolinguistic group, uh, they have a very famous archeological uh, research done by Donald uh, Lothrop a few years ago. I mean, yeah. so this one of the last groups that were uncontacted, they were contacted and half of the population was just, you know, genocide, was an ethnocide. But also the material, the little bit of material uh, artifacts of the culture were completely, you know, spoiling. So I got some myself, I give some to my friends and we just keep it because we, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't have nowhere where to take them. Just some museums, you know, have been interested in putting somewhere in a cave. We didn't want that because these people are still alive. And this is the only thing that they still can hold on. So the pictures that we took and the little feathers and some uh, very fragile ceramics and so is the only thing that is still remaining of their life. So pointing out was um, Francisco Corrales and, and, and Senor Amadori said about also the tourism and the preservation. One of the, maybe of the things that we should take care more is also not only the, with the infrastructures, you know, development projects, development cooperation projects. They are very usually taking a lot of damage, bringing a lot of damage to this area, you know, bringing this economic or soi-disant economic development to the people. And they are mainly contributing a lot to the destruction of the very fragile known material and material um, cultural heritage from, uh, from recently contacted people and the others. So, Maybe that's something we, we should work together with the institutions. And uh, I know they have this checklist. I work in that area. But in practice, uh, I think we need to push a little bit. Thank you. Um, I'm not certain that any of us have had experience with um, previously uncontacted people. The Amazonia really represents um, challenges that are quite unique. And there are archaeologists, both Brazilian and international, who have, in recent years, begun to establish a, a image of the Amazonian past, which is one of much larger populations, much more social complexity. Um, but the point that you're making about the need for uh, a, a sort of um, care and awareness of the ethnographic, uh, the, the living population, I think all of us would take as a first principle, certainly. Did we have another question? Uh, yes, I wanted to um, bring us back to the issue of tourism. Um, I'm coming to this symposium not as an anthropologist or an archeologist, but having much armchair tourism through National Geographic and having gone on an eight day tour to Costa Rica, um, and I think it, it's, it's important that there aren't walls put between tourists and these sites and tourists and the discipline because that's how we get interested in stuff, is by having been there or having heard about it or whatever. And I think for people to follow on and respect and understand the longer picture, you do need to involve tourists as a stakeholder and as part of the community as well as um, people with large feet. <laughs> Did you want to say something to that? Yes, uh, well, tourism has some positive and negative aspects, but uh, in the case of Costa Rica, where um, archaeology is no synonym, synonym of tourism, it's nature, uh, we are using um, the possibility of attracting visitors to those sites to promote their conservation and their uh, research. Uh, and at the same time trying to avoid some of the major problems of massive, massive tourism. But yet, uh, yes, you have to, to promote the visit of the sites uh, as a way to conserve, uh, preserve them. Uh, otherwise, uh, you don't have uh, communication with 
people taking decisions or giving you economic support at a, at a government level. Uh, you have to work in a way that you, you will have some visiting, but also you will not have all the bad sides of massive tourism. And I would also add, this also, you have to be honest with the public. You know, if, if tourism will be beneficial for a site in particular, be honest and say this will be an educational tour where such a, you know, it's not Cancun, right? It's not going for a weekend to Cancun. And I think that uh, when we just open up, you know, the Ruta Maya, everybody goes there expecting to stop at a bar, you know, around noon, then, you know, have supper. And they don't really uh, comprehend the impact they're having over the people on the site. So I think it's, it's also our responsibility and policymakers as well to create tourism specifically geared towards people who do want to contribute, who want to be part of, who are, care about the preservation of the site, or simply if they want to take pictures of the biggest temple. You know, so I think that that's missing, specifically of El Salvador. You know, when, when you go to an archaeological site, you don't really don't know what to expect. So you really can't expect the people who visit to have a positive contribution because there was nothing to prevent them from coming with the tool or having the knowledge to have a positive impact. I'll just add something quickly. I think um, there's a new model in a lot of different, in a lot of countries of how you can have the tourists participate um, in a way that doesn't harm the archeological record, um, that involves the archeologist um, and allows them to understand a deeper understanding of that site. Um, how, what that looks like and the policy behind it, I think is a really exciting and a dynamic kind of way that countries are looking at tourism as they train their tourism guides, um, but also as the way they, they talk to archeologists, the way they issue permits, and the way they allow for tourists to walk through archeological sites that are ongoing, that aren't you know, packaged up and, and being presented. So I, I think that's a really dynamic potential for the future. So literally um, taking down the wall so that while the archeology span is going on, uh, people who are travelers, and there's, there's a, uh, one of those memes, be a traveler, not a tourist. Um, and I'm very sympathetic to the idea that visitors to these sites are really important ambassadors to the rest of the world about why it's important to preserve them. The tension comes, I think, less from the tourist as tourist than from the developers of the infrastructure. And we're seeing that with um, incredible reports out of Mexico of very destructive construction of museums by a private Belgian chocolate company, Belgian chocolate museums that were uh, permitted again through somewhat corrupt means, and that the archaeological community and the travelers, the visitors, both should should reject. So, and I think we have one more question. And <laughs> oh, actually, mine might be a comment too. But thank you very much, all of you. You know, it has been a great discussion. One, one thing I have. I wanted to point out is that we have to be careful not only with the development or the construction of the of the infrastructure, but also the heritage loss that come as a, you know protecting the, the loss are passed to protect these these, uh, um, these archaeological sites from the impact of this, or sometimes the implementation of those laws. And I, I can think of several cases. For example, in Colombia, the development is going so fast they don't have enough archaeologists to keep up, so people are not supposed to be doing the work, they're doing it, and they're making mega box, and, and uh, when there's money, I think that, that brings a big problem with archaeology. Most archaeologists don't get into this business to get rich, right? I mean, we, we're poor, but uh, when money's there, it brings problems, and then there's people are not very well prepared, and, and yeah, they're, they're doing some reports and everything, they don't contact the local community many, many times, and uh, many times the reports are useless, or they end up in dusty, shelves in the government and nobody finds out what's going on there. And at the end, things are destroyed without the information being recovered either for the local community or for archaeology. In, in Brazil also, they were having the problem of, similar to, to the states in a way, that uh, French companies were moving in to do the contract work. Yes. And you know how when companies come from another state, even a state, they don't know that much about the area, but they have the contract, they do the minimum, maybe descriptive, and it, I mean, if we're lucky, there's some good information there and, you know, the bottom line is money. And uh, sometimes the laws can be good, sometimes they're not that great. The problem is for politicians, they solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to them, so the laws say, are you guys wanted it, we give it to you. Sometimes it's implementation, um, there's, there's many problems with this, and, and I think 
in a way, we archaeologists have, when we advise politicians to start thinking ahead of time how we can take care of the implementation, sometimes these laws are, are followed, but the, the spirit of the law is not fulfilled. And that's, that's the problem. A culture, good cultural heritage laws without the development of the capacity in the national um, archaeological community to get the, the contracts to carry them out and to do the analysis is just as bad as looting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And was there a final comment then? Yes, please. Um, I think one of the major problems in the case of Guatemala uh, for preserving uh, ancient heritage is the drug cartels. Petén, for example, is a vast territory, not under the control of government or archaeologists, anyone. They practically control the whole territory, and looting is a very constant in this region. So this is a major problem. A poor countries like Guatemala have major archaeological sites that don't have a way of controlling. The second issue is that the work of archaeology has been also damaging. So they provide information, but once they open something, they show there is something here, people will go and do the same somewhere else or, or in the same place where they are. So I think that the involvement of community during the research, right, in which they participate in the whole process, it, that will be good. Because in the United States, there are laws that prohibit to go and open a tomb anywhere unless you talk with the Native Americans, there are laws. In Latin America, in Central America, Guatemala, in the case, you just go and do the research. You ask permission to the government, or you ask permission to a university, which doesn't care about indigenous people. So that is a major problem, I think, in which you, we have to, to really share the laws that work in countries like the United States. That is a, 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 a problem that I see in Central American countries. So I think when I say this sharing, that will be good to see a Maya pottery. I have to come to Washington, New York, or any university, mm -hmm. Princeton, Harvard, because all of the pottery, beautiful Maya pots are there. Why not create a major museum for indigenous people in the region, so instead of taking them somewhere, they place it there if they find something. Yeah. In the past, my father had too much fear of handling a pot. He found one in a cave, and he said, don't touch it. This is the owner of the hills instrument. So when he went back to see it again two years later, it was broken into pieces. Somebody went there and smashed it. But if we have a place where to put it, maybe that will be. So education is very important. How can we share this knowledge? And, 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 and I think uh, exchange right, of, of objects uh, will be very important. I have to say that um, I would, I don't, you think ever, nobody here suggested the US was actually the model for cultural heritage preservation laws. Um, and in fact, outrageously, it's often possible to go and excavate with no consultation with the communities. So best practices everywhere would be to talk to the local people because they are the best stewards. Best practices everywhere would be to make certain that there's local sharing of information, whether that's a museum or even internet websites or lectures to school groups. And that's as true in North America, and I would not want anyone to leave here complacent about the North American U.S. situation because we certainly are not the model. Did you want to say something, Francisco? Yes, uh, I just want to emphasize the need of regional uh, initiatives at the Central American level. Uh, it has been very, very few during the last decades. Yeah, it's only when an international agency uh, goes there and promote a cooperation among the Central American countries that we are able to do something. Uh, I was part of a project uh, financed by the Swedish uh, International Cooperation Agency. And uh, once the, the money uh, finished, the, the, the agency didn't uh, fund the project anymore, we were not able to sustain the network of uh, Central American museums. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's something terrible. Even this exhibit was uh, another example of you know cooperation uh, among Central American countries when there is an international interest but we have been not able to uh, work uh, among themselves to promote uh, projects at the uh, Central American level. 
I guess uh, one of the untold stories for archaeology is the, the relationships that are created between the archaeologists and the locals. You know, this is, uh, in our experience in the past 15 years working in Quintana Roo, where we have developed several projects and I did my dissertation work there, we have developed such a bond that we have created a museum and they have themselves created uh, a bird watching uh, park and all these other activities that are stemming from the initial push of sharing. You know, not that we discovered anything. In fact, they knew it all along. They knew what was on their land, but when we shared our information with them from a different perspective, from aerial photographs, from possible interpretations, they were able to give it continuity. And so, you know, those are the type of stories that I think that are very positive. And it is, as, as was mentioned, it's, it's the most important thing, the relationship between what we, uh, as archeologists from the outside come in and the people that live at the sites that we're studying. Yeah, I'm, I'll echo both of those. The importance of regional cooperation um, is so very valuable. And then also the networks and the friendships, I would argue, that the archaeologists establish with local communities. And I think one of the, we are ideally positioned to do that as a collaborative partnership, precisely because most archaeological projects aren't for a month or a year or two years. Like Rosemary's been working in Honduras for 35 years. 35 years. Um, you talked about doing your dissertation work someplace that's five, six years, um, a decade in. And so that, that, those are long-term, sustained friendships over time. And I would just add that the best place in the world to see Honduras beautiful polychromes is the Museo de San Pedro Sula, which was developed by citizens in San Pedro and with the input from the archaeologists working. So these, these are the, the grassroots means to do these things, are to work with the local communities. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to invite uh, the director of the Smithsonian Latino Center to uh, say some closing words and to close off our symposium. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos. Thank you for being here um, to this, at this presentation. Um, this has been um, long anticipated after we um, mounted the show. Uh, San de los Ancestros. Has everybody seen the show, by the way? Okay. Whew. Well, I'm not going to have to berate you to go see the show, so, um, but thank you. Those of you who have not, uh, it's going to be, it's here at this museum, and it's going to be up until February of uh, 2015, so there's plenty of time uh, to, see the, to see the show. This is a very important con uh, conversation about the, his the issues of history, identity, and heritage, and I'm glad that you all uh, took, part, uh, took part in it. It has been recorded, by the way, and will be archived and it will be also available uh, to you in a little bit of time, so give us a little bit of time to kind of work this out on uh, the websites of both the, Na of both the National Museum of the American Indian and uh, the Smithsonian Latino Center, which I'm the director of. I want to thank our panelists, uh, the ones that are here present uh, as finishing this session, and also the ones that were here uh, uh, before. Most of you, by the way, probably have a book now, I would hope. Um, if you have not, I think we have some out. Ranald, do we have some more out in the, out in the, the table? I encourage you to say hello to some of the contributors who um, were very important to this book, Revealing Ancestral Central America, many of whom spoke here today. Um, they are Rosemary Joyce, present, John Hoops, Kristen Luke also, Anne McMullen, the curator of the, well, the principal curator of the exhibition, and Alex Benitez, the uh, guest curator of the show. I also want to acknowledge uh, Payson Sheets and Patricia Fernandez, who contributed essays but who are not able to be with us uh, today, as well as all of the photography, all of the design, the conservation, the collections management staff, um, who have done a remarkable job in preserving Central America's ancestral past here at the National Museum of the American um, Indian. Indian. Thank you for, to them to, and all of those who contributed uh, to the, the, uh, ex, the uh, publication and its success. Um, before you um, exit, uh, and you can, the exit uh, would be to the left of the entrance to, of the uh, exhibition, I'm sorry, of the, of the um, auditorium, which is kind of opposite from perhaps when you, where you came in. I want to remind you that next Saturday, the 14th of September, we're having um, a very large family day uh, that is going to be built around Central America, uh, obviously the exhibition and also Central American heritage. 
So we encourage you to come back. There's going to be some hands-on activities. It's very uh, kid-friendly, family-friendly, and we hope that you will join us um, at that time. Thank you again. Thanks again to the NMAI staff. How about a big round of applause for Randall Woodeman uh, of our staff. We, we've been at this for almost three years now, um, and uh, it's, it takes that long to do the kind of quality, um, thoughtful, uh, creative work that goes into not only an exhibition, uh, but the publication, uh, getting the right people involved with the publication and to the research, and Anne and, and all of the staff at the, uh, at the CRC here at, at, at NMAI. Uh, we love this project. Um, it has been a labor of love. We hope that you love it as much as we do and that you will continue to support activities around um, this exhibition. Thank you again for being here, and good afternoon.